everybody. Welcome to What a Hell of a Way to Die. It's Francis. And back with me in uh, the, the co-host seat is Nate. Nate, who has been running around all over the world with uh, his other podcasts. Uh, but Nate, how are you doing? Well, Francis, I'm going to be honest with you. I am fucking exhausted. And you got back a couple of days ago, didn't you? So you should be like, you should have bounced back by now, except you're in your mid to late 30s so we don't do well, that it's not just being in your mid to late 30s i mean i'm 38 but um i spent two weeks on the road in australia uh with trash future touring uh we flew down and we played two nights in brisbane one night in sydney one night in canberra two nights in melbourne and then i did a third night in melbourne as uh britonology with milo i then flew over to new zealand to see some friends uh that i know i knew through twitter but uh, that you know we got to be got to know each other during the lockdown talking when they lived in New. They live in New Zealand. They're they're from the UK, and uh, uh, New Zealand was in summer during British winter when everything was hell here, and you could do stuff in New Zealand. And uh, I got to know them, and I was like, "Well, fuck, man! If I'm ever get the chance to get down there, I'll come visit you." So did have the chance because it's not that far from Australia, and uh, it's still far, but it's not as far. Right. It's it's still like a six hour four flight. hours. Yeah, four hours from Melbourne to Christchurch, and then it was a about a three hour drive from Christchurch to where they live at on the South Island. So <laughs> Jesus, uh, there's a nearer airport, but it's, it's an hour and a half away. I mean, it's, it's New Zealand is strange, man. I mean, obviously I only spent a little bit of time in Auckland, like walking from the domestic terminal to the international terminal. So I have no idea other than what I saw from the air. Other than, I mean, Auckland's a city of like a million people, but the South Island is super rural. Like it, it, it I, I was expecting cold British Hawaii, but instead it was more like British Alaska. Uh, it reminded me a lot of Alaska, to be honest with you. I mean, it's always warmer this time of year, different climate. You know, it's an island in the South Pacific, but it, it's 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 wild, incredible, incredible landscapes, incredible like nature and stuff like that. But it's very strange because you'll be on a like a road where there's one road, one lane heading south, one lane heading north. That's the like the main national highway for the South Island, and it's just little tiny villages, like little little towns, and then periodically what looks like novelty oversized car factories because they're like big meat processing plants or uh big dairy processing plants but i think my friend was saying like something like maybe 10 15 percent of new zealand's population lives on the south island like it's pretty rural and pretty unpopulated like i want to say Christchurch is the biggest city on the on that island and it's like maybe three hundred fifty thousand people um dunedin where i flew out of is about a hundred thousand people um so i mean it's just it's a it's a pretty big country i mean like the, the combination of the north and south islands it's like maybe i would say it it, it it takes up maybe like half maybe a little more than the total space of california which is like a pretty big amount of land um but there's like five million people in that country and so um yeah was down there for just a couple days and then started my return journey from dunedin on the south island to auckland then flew to Melbourne, then flew to Malaysia, then flew to London. So it was about 35 hours, if you count layovers, about 26 hours of flying. And uh, it f- fucking sucked dick, dude. I'm, I'm so goddamn <laughs> exhausted from this shit. And I'm still waking up at like fucking three in the morning every day. Uh, I go to, I'm falling asleep at like nine and waking up at like three. And I, I, I know some people swear by melatonin. It does nothing for me. Uh, and obviously, I'm not going ah, to use mel- melatonin. Just gives me shitty sleep. Yeah, and I'm not going to use. I mean, like I used weed periodically, but the other night I I tried to use weed and it just just made me sad. <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't actually <laughs> sleeping. Um, so I went to the gym yesterday. I was hoping to go today, but I'm just I'm I'm feeling pretty fucked today. So I'll just go tomorrow. Um, but yeah, so I am I am exhausted. I got in Thursday night. Uh, it is we are recording this on Tuesday afternoon, and. Um, I actually feel as though it's worse this way than it is going to Australia. Uh, I got into Australia on a Sunday, and I would say that by Thursday, by the night of the Sydney show, I was doing a lot better jet lag wise, and that was on less sleep and way busier, and you know, having alcohol and stuff. Um, this is <laughs> this is way fucking worse, dude. Yeah, this. I mean, twenty six hours of flying, like that's a, uh, and you know, I haven't done this since you know my deployments but it is kind of a look i'm just gonna get on a plane and i will figure out what time it is when i get there um when i landed when i landed in afghanistan for the first time it was eight o'clock in the morning local time and the uh the sergeant that picked me up was just like you can't sleep you can't i know you want to but you can't because you'll be fucked up for weeks just 
don't sleep and you'll go to sleep at nine and you'll be fine. Um, which worked then, but also I was 20. So, you know, my body, my body now requires, you know, specific things to have a good night's sleep. Uh, and if I don't just my entire day is ruined. I actually slept. I normally can't sleep on planes. Um, but I found that the noise canceling headphones and wearing a sleep mask, like to cover my eyes actually worked. I didn't sleep a lot, but I slept maybe three or four hours on the Melbourne to Kuala Lumpur flight, which was like, it like took off a little before 1 a.m. And then you're going backwards in time. So eight hour flight, you get to Kuala Lumpur in um, around 6 a.m. And then honestly, like we had the windows closed and stuff for the Kuala Lumpur to London flight. Um, and I slept a little on that, but like it was already sort of felt like a new day. Um, yeah, so it was to, to, for those of you who are curious, who who want to um, examine the fucking the trajectory of this. I got up where my in the town my friends live in. We went out, got lunch. They drove me to the airport in Dunedin. Um, that was about I was about an hour and a half drive to Dunedin, and then probably about a I try a twenty minute drive from the city to the airport because the city's on the coast and and in the mountains and in, in the hills basically, and they needed a flat area to put the airport in. So the airport is like a twenty minute drive out into a valley somewhere. Um, so and I just want to uh, and I you know, just in case ever other people didn't realize this, I did not realize that New Zealand was two completely disconnected islands. Yes. Like there's no, you know, I knew that there were two islands, but I didn't know there wasn't like a bridge between them at least. Like which makes sense why the the southern island might be more rural. It's just not connectable. Like you got to get on a boat or an airplane, which are is not. It's just not easy, you know, as just get in the car and we'll drive down. We'll go across the big bridge that goes to the South Island. So I can't you know, imagine they could that, build a bridge. I mean, they might be able to. I think it's a, it's probably longer than something that's feasible or was feasible until relatively recently. But Wellington and Christchurch are in an area that's like that's the, the cities on opposite sides of the fucking strait. Um, it is so insanely windy in Wellington, according to people I know who spent time there. So something tells me. Here's the thing, right? Like where we were at was just south of the 45th parallel. So like you're pretty far south. That's the furthest south I've ever been on the planet. And you're pretty close to Antarctica, like relatively speaking, not like next door, but like you feel the fucking how cold the wind is and stuff, even when the sun is bright and, and the sun is really intense down there. So like you definitely feel like, okay, this is super bright sun. This is super like warming feeling when the sun's out. But like the minute you're in the shade on a hot day, it's like, fuck, it's cold. Like I felt cold. My friend's kid, born and raised there, uh, was just like not bothered by the shade and not bothered by like early mornings in their house. Whereas like I was like, put the fucking puffy coat on immediately. <laughs> like I want to wear a beanie. I want to zip up like it's my fucking Equix winter gear because um, it's just not used to how cold it is. I mean, like, and that was it. We actually had pretty good weather. It was actually temperature wise warmer where I was in New Zealand than in um, in Melbourne because they're having a La Nina right now and. Uh, Melbourne, like Sydney had amazing weather. Brisbane had amazing weather. Canberra had fucking shit weather because it's kind of up in the mountains. So it's, we, I think it, we woke up and it was like in the 40s. Um, Melbourne can have great weather and can have dog shit weather. And unfortunately, we got dog shit weather. It was really windy, really rainy, really cloudy. Um, and so I got to New Zealand and it was, the temperature was like a high of 21 Celsius, which is like, I think 72, 70, something like that. Um, whereas in Melbourne, it was like a high of like 60, maybe, and rainy. Uh, and we were way further south of Melbourne, but right now, like they're having all this climactic stuff, you know, stuff with La Nina. Uh, you're near Antarctica, and you absolutely feel it. Like it's just it's a, it's a very very strange sort of 45 degrees north in in North America is warmer in summer uh, and probably colder in winter than that. Um, it's just it, but it's very strange because you're sort of like, yeah, this is a climate zone I've just never been in in my life. And that's the thing that was like the overwhelming feeling for me being down there. And I wasn't there that long is that Australia is fucking far as hell from everything, but Australia is big. And so it's, it's not a huge population relative to the size of the country. It's like 28 million people, I think. But you know, Sydney's a city of almost 6 million people. Melbourne's a city of like five and a half million people. Um, you know, Brisbane's like, I think 2 million, two and a half million. So like you get the sensation of like, I'm in a big city. I'm in a really developed country. Um, New Zealand, you, you can kind of tell, at least on the South Island, that it's poorer than Australia, 
but also like it's just so incredibly far from everything and like it's really rural like i said you know the biggest city on the south island is yeah like 330 350,000 people and so you just get this sensation not being from there of like wow i'm i'm at the end of the earth like this is the furthest i've ever been from from the rest of the world ever in my life and um I don't know if you if you heard this, but you know the Boeing Dreamliners, the new newish aircraft, they're pretty sick. I mean, like they have some stuff in them that makes them more comfortable than regular planes, but like they're like way lighter than than regular jetliners, and so you can fly routes, uh, longer routes, but you can also fly direct routes because like it just they burn way less fuel because they're way lighter, and so that's let airlines do certain routes that they normally wouldn't do because the, the fuel cost would make them really unprofitable unless they were like fully packed to the gills the whole time, which just isn't realistic. Like my flight Auckland to Melbourne was pretty, that's a pretty busy route. And that, that was full, but like uh, Kuala Lumpur to London was maybe half full. So like, you know, sometimes these long haul flights aren't going to be that busy because of the Dreamliner. Like some, some routes are actually faster now too, because I, I guess the plane can go faster being lighter. I have no idea, but also they can go further. And Air New Zealand has just opened a direct New York City to Auckland flight. So you can fly direct from New York City to New Zealand with no stops in between. They used to land in LA and refuel and then fly to New Zealand. But now it's, it's like 16 hours down and like 18 hours back. I'd do that. I, you know, my, my flight, you know, with, with flying and everything, I just don't like the changeovers, the moving land at this airport like you know you're landing Kuala Lumpur you have to get off you have to get your shit you have to get to the next airplane if you could just get like I'll sit in a in a seat for 16 hours if you give me movies and you regularly feed me shots of vodka I'll be fine yeah man I mean honestly I'd love to go down and see my friends again and the thought crossed my mind that like even though this tax on maybe an additional hour of flying versus going via Asia I would just fly to New York and overnight at my friend's place and then just like go to JFK, eat an edible right before I go through security and get on that <laughs> fucking flight and just be down there. Like, whatever. I mean, there's flights... Because um, I'm in the olden days, like, and I think this is still the case with older aircraft. Um, it's like 14 and a half hours from, uh, from LA to Auckland. Um, and I know there's flights from places like Dallas or Houston uh, to Auckland now too. Uh, you can fly direct from Dubai to Auckland, and that's like the same amount of time. But that's on Emirates, and they fly with an A380, so it's a fucking gigantic aircraft, and like it's slow, like it's slower than that that Dreamliner flight. So my thought is like, yeah, honestly, if I was gonna go back down there, I'd probably just book two tickets and then like you know have it be a uh, an overnight stay in New York on the way down and on the way back, um, and then just yeah, just it would have to be a longer trip. And that's the thing, right? Like if Cynthia gets time off from work, you know, you have to ask yourself the question, do you want to expend what limited vacation you have on a trip where you are going to lose two days each way, basically? And also you are going to be jet lagged to the end of this fucking earth. Um, <laughs> like, yeah, I don't like going to California, which has a two hour difference from what I'm at. Like, the other side of the world, not only the other side of the world, but I don't think I've ever been south of uh, of the equator. So that's also that also would just fuck me up. That's something weird. That's something weird about being south of the equator. I mean, going south doesn't do anything with jet lag. It's just the east west time zone shit. But yeah, I mean, it's fucking. Look, if I show up somewhere in December and it's fucking hot, that's gonna throw me. It's off. weird. No, it's weird. Believe me, but it's also nice because I live in this fucking stupid country where it's so wet and cold and dark. <laughs> like the sun came up. Obviously, I'm waking up crazy early right now, and the sun. Like I, I'd been up for over four hours when the sun came up this morning because it doesn't rise until after eight this time of year, and it's two. Se- it goes down at like three thirty. Yeah, like three fifty. Yeah, definitely. It absolutely does. It's dark by four. Um. So for me, like going down there, I mean, just, oh God, it's so like Sydney. Okay. Sydney really struck me as a sort of like head is purely empty. I've got nothing but vibes kind of city, but man, like I'm going to be honest with you. You can't beat the weather. It's incredible. Like I, Melbourne was a cool city. It's a really, really interesting city. It has basically European weather down there. Uh, Brisbane is like Australian Florida, but is really cool. People are really nice. It's a really nice place. Like I, I, I really enjoyed Brisbane a lot. Canberra sucks, but I think all Australians will agree with you that Canberra sucks. Um, it was a nice venue. We had a nice crowd. It was fine. It's just, you know, it, it's it's the capital, and it just it's just a very very strange city. It's very very suburban, 
and all this the like the best way I could describe Canberra is it's like in relatively speaking because Australia is so flat it's like kind of high in the mountains for there it's got colder kind of mountainous weather and um it's like a city of lots and lots and lots of suburbs that feel more or less like suburban Virginia and then a city center that feels like Charlotte North Carolina without the tall buildings very strange place um Melbourne, by contrast, is like the central business district is just tons of skyscrapers. Like Milo booked us an Airbnb and we were on the 25th floor of a 54-story residential building, which is like not quite Hong Kong dimensions, but it's getting there. You know what I mean? Sure. I mean, that's that's a big, tall building that people live in. We know. I mean, I'm not going to say that we don't have those in St. Louis, but we certainly don't have them to that like extent. Yeah. And... um I mean, by comparison, it's weird. New Zealand doesn't just, I mean, I didn't see anything like that. I didn't spend any time in the city of Auckland, so I, I couldn't say what it's like, you know, in the actual urban area. But um, yeah, like New Zealand felt like a mishmash of every country I've ever been to in my life. New Zealand felt like you squint and it's America, it's the Midwest, you squint and it's Colorado, you squint and it's Alaska, or it's Hawaii, or it's Korea. Like it's is very very strange. I, I strongly recommend anybody who's interested if you can if you can afford the trip and the time off, go down and check it out. It's an absolutely beautiful country. I would I would love to go back. Uh, I a flight for me to to Auckland uh, is like two thousand dollars. Yeah, so it's not cheap. Patreon dot com slash hell of a way to die. <laughs> it's not cheap, man. Yeah, I mean that was the thing that was a benefit, right? Is that because we were touring, like that was tickets being booked paid for by the show. To bring us down mm-hmm. there, and then I just had to pay for, and it wasn't cheap either on Qantas. It was like fucking eight hundred dollars for a round trip ticket from um from a uh, uh, Melbourne to Dunedin. Um, so yeah, man. I mean, like I, once again, it's one of those things where it's like it's a huge privilege if you have the ability to travel like that. And and in my case, like I I don't know if I could have justified the expense if I was going down having never been there, like not really, you know, if it was just being a kind of like oh a tourism kind of like wouldn't it be cool to go there kind of thing. And obviously, like, there's a lot of places I want to visit too that are way closer to where I live now. Um, but talking about jet lag, dude, like, um, so uh, New Zealand is 13 hours ahead of the UK. So in your case, that means it is 19 hours ahead of you because you are six hours behind me. So that's basically the equivalent of it being five hours ahead. So like, it's it's not great, but but the closer you are to 12 hours, the worse it is. Like, it's just it's annoying no matter what. But like. Like I wasn't super jet lagged when I flew to to, to Australia uh, for work when I was in the army, because um, Brisbane was 18 hours ahead of Anchorage, so it was like a six hour time zone difference. It sucked. It was weird, but like you got over it. Whereas this might be the worst shit I have ever felt in my life when it comes to jet lag. <laughs> I mean, America to Korea was pretty bad. America to Japan was pretty bad, but I think the combination of being really tired um and then already from the tour and then that trip being what it was um and then like just the distance of it and the stress because because uh my flight was delayed and so i i was gonna need to go out of the security area recheck my bag but i didn't have any time so i had to go down to the fucking gate and just be like hey i'm in a really bad situation my bag is gonna be at fucking baggage claim right now i don't know if there's any way to to get it on the plane and they, they actually sorted me out that's one thing I'll tell you. People in Australia are really nice. Like genuinely, I just just it's just a different it's a different country. Like Australia has not been doing austerity on itself for the last 40 years. It's a fucked up country with huge problems, but it's just a different feeling being down there. Like I I was very surprised. Like quality of life stuff seems really high. Sometimes it's nice to visit a place that's fucked up and for completely different reasons than what you're Yeah, used to. it's it, it's fucked up cuz it's, you know, its economy is dependent on extracting stuff that causes climate change. And it's also one of the most climate change vulnerable countries on earth. It's also got a really, really gross history. It doesn't want to acknowledge whatsoever in terms of like that. It was basically no different than apartheid South Africa until the eighties. Um, New Zealand is the same and it's, it's very, very different story, but like similar problems. Um, but uh, food's great. Coffee's incredible. Weather's really nice in Sydney and uh, and Brisbane. I'd say, yeah, like uh, your New South Wales, your Queensland weather, great. Victoria, less great. Canberra sucks. ACT sucks for weather. Uh, and I'm being facetious because actually, I think it's it's pretty good by and large. It's just that we got unlucky. Um, but yeah, man, um, 
I, I am very grateful. And there was a very strange moment. Uh, me and Milo were hanging out after, I want to say it was after Britonology was done. So we were done, done with, with any stuff related to like the tour. He was still doing some stand up shows, but like he's used to gigging all the time. And I was just, we were, we had this balcony on the 25th floor and, you know, uh, nicotine vapes are illegal in Australia, but you can absolutely buy them. You just have to fucking kind of know where to look. And like we're, we're, knowing where to look is basically look for the scuzziest corner shop and they'll probably have them. Uh, so we're out, you know, hitting, hitting, hitting. Can, can you get some, can you get some spice to smoke there too? No, but they have legal weed there. You can't get a nicotine vape, but you can get uh, a, a, a weed vape. You can't get a weed vape. You can get weed by prescription and in the ACT, it's legal to grow your own. Uh, I think they are moving towards eventually having it be just like recreational legal stuff, but like it's not hard to get weed in Australia. But no, I think any Australian who's honest with you, and I'm paraphrasing a tweet that was very popular amongst Australians, any Australian who's honest with you will say that despite their national myth of being these sort of free-spirited people who have disrespect for authority, uh, they're actually a nation of cops. Like every, <laughs> like they are, it is a far more bureaucrat, bureaucratic and kind of like a... Uh, what's the right word here? Kind of let's all follow the rules and enforce the rules kind of society versus, versus Britain or America. I mean, America, America is weird because we all, we, we basically don't respect the rules, but the cops can kill you based on a rule that you may or may not be following. Um, and Britain just, uh, I don't know how to describe it. Britain is basically, Britain's just chaos zone. Like Britain is basically the rules exist, but we've defunded all of the things that would normally enforce them. So like we'll enforce them if we get around to it, which sounds cool, except also then like a lot of crime is legal in the sense of just like fraud and bullshit like that, which makes life here kind of annoying. Um, but yeah, weed vapes. Well, I don't know. Weed is legal in a certain capacity uh, in many places. Uh, I, I had heard from some people that they're going to get legal weed in New South Wales, uh, but in the Australian capital territory, weed's pretty much legal. Um, I don't know about Victoria, but uh, but it didn't seem like people in Victoria had much of a challenge acquiring weed. And then I don't know, I don't know about New, New Zealand had a referendum, but it failed. Um, so I, I I couldn't tell you, man. Well, you can come to Missouri if you need some free some some legal weed because apparently we're all about fly it now. up from Auckland all the way to like I don't know fucking Dallas. I'm sure it's the worst flight any human has ever done, and then take a nice little God, connector you- to St. Louis. I would just say you can land in Los in Los, Los Angeles, Angeles and, yeah, and get weed. I, I, the last time, the last time I well, not maybe it was the last time I was in California. Um, I was staying at a really nice hotel, and it was such a novelty to like call somebody and order weed and have it delivered to me at a very nice hotel. That's so like, cool! Oh, I gotta, I gotta leave the pool. I gotta go meet my weed guy. That's so fucking and, uh, sick, man. I mean, I was spoiled I in Britain because I was like, yeah, in Britain you can use the food delivery apps to have someone bring you booze and nicotine vapes. Not a thing in Australia. That's not a thing. That's not a thing here either. Can't get, uh, can't get booze delivered through you know your normal. Yeah, yeah. Store Britain doesn't app, have like blue laws and shit like that. So, but I was gonna say. Yeah, I, I I didn't finish the story about this. We had this sort of weird moment on the balcony when I was just talking to Milo and I was just like, yeah, it seems kind of crazy that when you think about like this stupid podcast that we used to record at like on the little picnic table outside of Riley's apartment has brought us here. Like we haven't acquired fame and fortune, but like, you know, we make a living and we've also just done a, we we didn't sell out Canberra because it was a big venue, but we sold out every other venue. Like we had to add second nights because we'd sold out the nights, the first nights there. And it's just sort of like, so all in all, I mean, it's not huge amounts. All in all, we probably sold like, I don't know, 1,200 tickets. But like the fact that we, we turned a profit on a tour that brought us to Australia and we toured a foreign country, like, and then you, you find yourself in this, for better or worse, this city that feels like, you know, dream city from the future, uh, you know, sitting on a balcony, like way high up in the sky. You're sort of like, what the fuck kind of life? Like this is in a good way. You're like, wow, what the fuck kind of life am I living? Yeah, my... Whenever I'm meeting new people, I generally like. Thankfully, I have a normal, like, regular job that I can tell people. Like, yeah, I fix I fix computers for this big ass company. Um, I'm I'm a big I'm a little cog in this big machine. And you know, like, once I kind of get to know them a little bit more, I'm like, okay. So also, I have this podcast that actually makes more money than my regular job, but not by much. But also, yeah, I make money just talking into a microphone, and it's 
it's kind of weird. It's kind of, I don't understand it. And like a lot of times I don't want to say it out loud because I don't want somebody to be like, hey, wait a minute, you're not supposed to do that. You're not, you're not supposed to like turn a profit entertaining people by talking into a microphone. Um, but yet here we are. I mean, shit, I use the military to, you know, I use the military to uh, get a free, a quote, free trip to Japan and spend two weeks in Japan. Um, so, you know, no reason to not use the, your, your podcast for the same thing. And you know what? This, this fucking beats doing, you know, any other. This is the, the, the best job I've ever had. Um, and it's and certainly like I don't ever want to, you know, uh, say that what we do is easy because it's not. But also it's not it's not hard. I've done hard work. I've worked in restaurants. It's not working in a restaurant. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I worked in a restaurant. As always, thank you all for, for giving us for giving us your five dollars a month. Uh, those of you who do. But yeah, it's very it's very strange to have to to try to explain something like this to like because the vast majority of Americans don't really, they know podcasts exist, but they're like, yeah, it's like the, there's a true crime podcast and NPR like has three Tim podcasts. Heidecker, and that's all of Joe them, Joe right? Rogan. Yeah. Stuff like that. Right. Like all these things that I hear and, uh, about uh, on, you know, on the news because those are the big ones. And they said, no, you can, any jackass can do this. Like you just like, I still do this with a microphone in an office and my old, my old laptop. Like there's no, all the people with their like, really fancy setups and everything. I'm always jealous of that, but also like that just seems, it seems overkill. You don't really need all it that was really, stuff. I mean, unless you it want was it. really funny because there's some guys that I got linked up with through a friend who are like the uh, Australian version of Trash Future. I mean, they're a much bigger show and they, they have like a podcast network and like a bunch of different shows on it, but they're really popular in Britain. So they fly up, you know, probably once a year, or once every two years to tour Britain and play do live podcasts all over the country and they have a studio too. So it's like we went down hung out in their studio. Me and Milo recorded with them. They, they did the Britonology with us live in Melbourne. Um, and it, it was great people. It's, it's called Sans Pants Radio. Uh, that's the whole podcast network. They're, they're really, really cool people. And um, it was just weird because I think it was a similar situation of sort of like they were university students that were doing like a radio show that they also did a podcast version of and they realized they could do it um, as a, you know, to make a living. And that's, you know, been the sort of through line for all the stuff they do since then. Uh, and I mean, for us, like, you know, the, the live shows were great. I mean, like, I would say by far the show in Sydney was the best. It was just so much fun. It was a completely sold out crowd in a venue that seated 220 people. Um, we had an episode, Riley had been saving, he'd been edging for months, saving up all of the content about the Saudi Arabian project to make a city that's in a straight line. And <laughs> God, I saw that. Yeah. And, and, and the crowd went fucking nuts for, I mean, dude, it was so good. It was such a good show. Like that to me was one of the highlight. I mean, cause, cause Sydney was funny. The world cup of cricket was on at the time and, and we had kind of booked some stuff last minute cause we didn't want to book accommodations till we got our visas, but we didn't know there was one extra step in the visa process that we didn't quite understand until, you know, we got it sorted out. And so trying to book accommodations meant that like everything was booked up in Sydney by that point. So in order to not like blow any profits that we would have earned on accommodations, we wound up staying in a budget Ibis, which I mean, it, everything works, but it, it was like staying in a barracks room. Um, so there was a part of me that like Sydney was, it was the longest stretch of the, tr of the tour. We were there for six days. We did, we got in, we did one show and then we hung out and then we, um, we, we drove to Canberra uh, that Tuesday did the show, then drove to Melbourne the next day and did, did two shows down there. But in Sydney, like, you know, I got to go running in the park at beautiful weather, like we hung out with a bunch of people we knew, uh, went to a lot of nice dinners because Riley is with us and we always have nice dinners when Riley's around as long as there's a, there's a company card involved. Um, <laughs> it, it was, it was, it was such a great, ex that was a really great experience, honestly. Um, I don't really remember the Brisbane shows. People seemed to like them. They were full. The crowds loved it. I was so fucking jet lagged. The first night Milo had food poisoning, he had actually had to fly the whole trip down with food poisoning. Uh, he was so sick, dude. Ooh. He was. I. I. I, th I thought. Ugh. I thought he was gonna have to go to the hospital. He was so sick. Just throw yourself out of an I airplane. Took him, I took him. I took him to the doctor. I mean, obviously, like he. It wasn't like he had to be taken. He. He agreed to go, but uh, got him. You know, just to a. a, a you know, a fucking like urgent care kind of place. Um, because he was just doing so poorly. Um. But, uh, I mean, there are times when I 
I think to myself, like, I can't believe I do this for a living. And there are times when I think to myself, like, what the fuck am I doing with my life? This is insane. Like, part of me just wants to be fully anonymous again. But it it was great. It was a really good experience. Um, I, I, I think we'll probably do it again in a while because it's such an undertaking. Um, and it's so far. No, we want we want to we want to come to we want to come to America. I will look if you guys even if you guys just do New York. If you give me like some months of like, hey, we're gonna be there in six months. I will because my wife wants to go to New York. I haven't been to New York City since I was like twelve. So and she, you know, she wants to go just because it is you know kind of a cultural epicenter of America and there's a lot of stuff there. So if you guys are gonna be in New York City, we will figure out a way to come out and do some kind of joint podcast or something where I can just glom on to the rest of you guys and, uh, and sell merch at a booth outside. Oh yeah. Well, that's the funny thing too, dude. We, uh, we sold merch for this show for all of our shows, but because of the ultra cops and the Australian government, it's very challenging to get, uh, if you're not kind of sorted out in advance, it's very difficult to get the authorization. You need to be registered as a business to allow yourself to get like a square point of sale terminal to take cards. So basically our merch was like, you, we could accept bank transfers because we had something set up as like a multi-currency account, but mostly it was like, hey, can you please bring cash? So imagine selling merch at sold out shows in cash in a currency you don't fucking recognize. <laughs> Jet lagged as lovely. shit. Love it. The good news is <laughs> in Australia is that all the money is color coded. So it actually makes it a little bit easier. Uh, oh, well that's, that's, yeah, that's Hundreds nice. are green, fifties are yellow, uh, 20s are red, uh, 10s are blue, and 5s are purple. Um, and you can fold the 50 note in a way that makes it look like a whale sucking a dick. Every Australian <laughs> wanted to show this to me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious. So, I, I think, you know, one thing that I, you know, this kind of reminds me of the, the globetrotting podcaster is, you know, smaller, you know, when bands would tour Europe, but like not big bands, not like, you know, fucking, I don't know, who's, who's big now? Um, Dua Lupo something? Dua Lipa. You know, the smaller. Come on. Respect Albanian excellence, all right? Her name is Dua Lipa <laughs> and she's from Britain, but she's Albanian. But, but you know, the, the kind of hand to mouth across, uh, across Europe of like, we're going to play a gig if you'll feed us and give us, you know, 50 bucks for gas money to get to the next gig. Um, you know, you guys get to do it a little bit nicer and stay in nicer places and eat a little bit nicer, but you don't have to learn how to play an instrument. Although you guys, you do know when's, uh, when's the, uh, when's the band going to tour? I am choosing to not answer that question because I might incriminate myself. <laughs> <laughs> the thought of schlepping oh, did- fucking gear all over Australia after doing that, like, eh. one of the just, somebody came. Just do it around, do it around France first. You know, kind of, kind of make it, make it an easy. No, it's your fault for picking the keyboard. No, I mean, I would just rent rent equipment, but um, I don't know. I mean, some of the fans in Australia were like, "Oh, I was disappointed. I was hoping that there would be a Clogheads performance too." And I'm like, "I'm sorry, but like, I just d- d- the funny thing is with the music is we love doing it. It's been one of the best things I've." done in, in the last stretch of my life like it's been really wonderful and I, I i'm excited to keep doing it i i music to me now has become a thing that's like just pure positivity in my life and it's a thing that i never in a million years thought i would find myself doing and i didn't think i had any ability for it um and i don't necessarily know if i do have any ability for it i'm just really good at copying and i know what to google about like you know what chords can you use in a in a you know major minor key signature you know, it, with with music, just like podcasting, you either need to be really good at it or really funny. And you guys have the you guys at least have the funny part down. The really good at it can come with time and uh, and everything. But you know, an entire song dedicated to honk ball, um, nobody does that. Oh, dude! Some people like there was a tweet that went viral while we were down there, where somebody had just they had realized once again that the the Dutch word for Major League Baseball is honk ball hoofdklasse. I mean, I'm saying it wrong, but yeah. Um, one of my friends actually is part Dutch and she she spent a lot of time there as a kid and she heard the way I pronounced it from the song and she's like, you're fucking killing me, dude. It's like Honkbal Hoped class or something like that. Like it's it's very, very different than how I was saying it. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the people, the people of the northern, um, the northern latitudes have like a new, have a whole pocket in their throat that the rest of us don't have where they can make those sounds. That tweet went viral and a bunch of people were tagging in the song and acting like it was a real song and not a joke. And 
there was one person who um, I saw a quote tweet and they didn't realize it was a joke. And they were like, what the fuck, man? How did the Dutch manage to write a song in the 80s that's better than anything Jonathan Richmond ever did? Now, I don't know if you know Jonathan Richmond, the modern lovers. He was like, he's like the patron saint of Boston music. But like, it, he's like, I'm not as good of a songwriter as Jonathan Richmond. You cannot fucking praise me like that. Like, please do not under any circumstances say something that nice about me. But like, it's very funny to see people react to this stuff. And sometimes when they aren't aware that it's a joke as part of a stupid British podcast, just unironically like it. Like, I, I remember somebody who was a fan saying that, that they had been listening to, to TF and they heard um, one of the songs that we don't really perform that much because, like, we did it as a joke, but, like, it's a little bit too dark to, to, uh, to have on in the same... It's the one where we wrote, we wrote a song that wasn't... It wasn't Johannes Vonk and the Clogheads. It was a fake sort of, like, British rock star guy who's uh, being confronted in a news... Or like, a radio interview about a song that he wrote in the 1980s, basically bra- bragging about being Jeffrey Epstein's best friend. And he's trying to like <laughs> argue his way out of it and be like, no, actually you're misinterpreting the lyrics. That's not, it's, it, and, and, and the chorus is just literally Mr. Epstein, won't you give me a call? So like, like it's, it's very stupid. That one, that one, that was all me. I, 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 you can blame me. You can, you can, you can cancel me for that one. But um, yeah, somebody had, had been listening to it and they, they, they were listening to the show and they just heard that and they were like, damn, I, I, I thought I was listening to the magnetic fields or something. I was like, once again, I appreciate the fact that someone made this comment three years ago and I still remember it is, is proof enough that it obviously lodged itself in my brain. But there's also a part of me that hears someone say something like that. And me as a magnetic, magnetic fields fan, it's just like, don't, don't say that. Don't, don't, don't never in a million years should you let me start to think that I'm fucking on that level because it's terrible. I'm going to embarrass myself. I have to keep it incredibly stupid and I have to stay humble. But um, Well, the, the way that you do that is just continue to have imposter syndrome, which um, so far, 40 years for me, thumbs up. Been doing imposter syndrome for the longest time and it's kept me humble. Yeah, well, I mean, but to answer your question, uh, Riley does another podcast with uh, a guy named Dan Beckner. He's one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. And Dan is now um, at age like 44, uh, suddenly in a band that makes a ton of money because he was brought on to be a touring member of Arcade Fire and now has joined the band like formally, I think. But Dan has been a professional musician since he was 18. And he's been in bands that have been incredibly highly praised critically, but they aren't bands that have made a ton of money. And his stories from touring, like... What we just experienced in in Australia was a luxury tour compared to what Dan has put up with. <laughs> like, just some of the most fucked up shit you can... Like, he had one story where they played a show in Italy and then they were going to play a show in Albania and, like, they had to travel by boat, but they had to, like, be on the top deck of a boat with their gear lashed to them, like, in a fucking gale. Like... <laughs> because lashed to them so it didn't fall overboard, but also so it didn't get stolen somehow. Like his stories are just unfucking believable and you should listen to Bottleman because periodically they do a bonus episode called Rock Talk where Dan just tells insane touring stories that it nuts stuff um but i mean to be honest with you francis i'm rambling more than normal cuz of my uh, my total just inability to be in the right place in time right now but um yeah i mean it's been good the music stuff's been good we have some stuff in the works right now, some songs. We want to eventually get enough together and try to work with someone to get it kind of packaged up to then put out a vinyl record. But it's just been kind of an insane year. You know, I, I got hurt in a bike wreck. I got COVID. Cynthia got COVID. Uh, Milo's mom died. Like, Milo got COVID. We have to tour Australia. Like, it's been, it's, it's just been. You know, you know, you know what, Nate? You got, you got plenty of time. Yeah, I hope so. like there's nothing. Yeah, there, there's nothing. Like that's that's one thing that I'm kind of realizing now. Of our my youth is, um, I, I remember a lot of you know when you hit thirty, you hit forty, you hit fifty, you get those, um, uh, you know, over the hill, uh, smoking cigarettes and drinking wine because uh, life is pretty much over. But you know, you don't. Uh, you know, you got plenty at our age still. I mean, you and I are both near forty, but I'm 
pretty sure we can both run a 5k without a problem we can uh you know fairly healthy mentally physically um emotionally that's that's just a recipe for for podcasting i guess you i mean look it really does help to be kind of emotionally fucked up to be a podcaster but if you want to continue to podcast and you want to be successful at it you have to have some modicum of uh, uh of adulthood and uh and maturity there which is why i imagine trash future works is because nate <laughs> nate's there somebody somebody to keep the kids in line yeah i mean it was strange because when you think about a situation like that that far from home having to depend on each other that many performances it seems like it could be an opportunity for everything to go wrong and everyone to hate each other and fight and have it not work but i think it was the opposite it was the most that the four of us cuz alice couldn't come just for a variety of reasons uh the four of us it was the most we'd been together since pre covid i think it was in the grand scheme of things it was the most we'd spent time together as a group ever and it actually wound up, I think, bringing everyone together quite a bit. And it was kind of like a crucible experience, you know what I mean? In the sense that like, you just got to be on, you got to perform a lot. You have to do it, in some cases, multiple nights in a row, you know, go to the venue, do the sound check, do the show, uh, you know, do all the merch, pack all the shit up, do all the hospitality stuff afterwards, either go out or meet fans, talk to people, do it again. And... I think we just got good at it and we got good at working crowds. We got good at knowing like what, you know, how to jump in, what was going to like, we were already experienced. We've done a ton of live shows before, but this just felt like a, like a big proof of concept for us. And, and I'll be honest with you too, man. Like I won't, I won't embarrass my friends by, uh, by, by name checking them. But uh, when I got to New Zealand, my, my, my friend was just like, bro, you were exhausted. You are absolutely fucking exhausted. And he was like, I had had grand plans that I was going to take you out to Mount Cook and stuff. And we'd do like six, seven hours out in the car, go out and do it. He's like, nah, we're not doing that. You're going to rest. We're going to do some smaller trips. And I can't tell you how much I appreciated someone just like looking me up and down and being like, no, I'm taking care of you. Yeah. I mean, it can't be the people that you're just with because they're fucking exhausted they too. Are. So you got to you gotta get I'm that I'm the most mature outside. of them by far. So did you? Did only you go to New yeah. Zealand? The rest of them went home. Yeah, I was just seeing okay. friends. They went home. Ry- Riley and uh, Hussein actually got on. Uh, we had the, a flight booked. We did the last show, and then we finished up with merch. Uh, we went back to the Airbnb and got their bags and stuff, and got them in a cab to Melbourne International. Uh, and they flew out that night. And then me and Milo uh, did the Britonology the next night in Melbourne. Uh, we went and recorded with the Sans, Sans Pants guys the next day, that Sunday. Um, and then Monday, I flew to New Zealand and Milo flew, I think, Tuesday to... He's got family in, in Brisbane, so he went up to see his cousin, do a show in Brisbane, and then back to Sydney to do another show there. And then he flew to uh, South Korea because he had he got, he'd been booked for a bunch of um, Russian language gigs up there. So he did like three or four nights in Seoul uh performing in russian and then um he just got back i think last night or this morning um so yeah i just i i i just knew people um i mean I, people just have met through twitter but like you know like anything with internet stuff you start talking especially during covid you talk to a lot of people and just you know you have a lifeline to the outside world um with with the, the potential for twitter to be on the downward spiral it did make me reflect a lot on the extent to which everything I've ever done for writing, everything I've ever done for podcasting and for, you know, for so much of this kind of work and a lot of great friends that I've met, it's all been through Twitter. It's weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I am glad that, you know, we built this podcast kind of through Twitter, but we don't really talk about it on Twitter. I mean, I post about it sometimes when I remember to, but, uh, so I'm not too worried about, you know, the downfall of Twitter, uh, and, and the show, but it is, uh, it is kind of a, when you just watch somebody fuck up something that you like so much and you're just like, but we liked it. It was good. It was working perfectly fine as was. And, uh, you know, much, much like public transportation, Elon Musk is here to fuck up, fuck everything up for shits and giggles. 
Um, I'm sure somebody is is prodding him to to destroy Twitter for some reason. I don't know, but uh, yeah, it does it does suck. I've met a lot of really cool people. I've built you know we've built this entire business off of Twitter, and uh, I have no desire to go to anywhere else. Like I'm not going to make TikToks. I hate it. It's too much effort. Like I like to be stoned and think of a thought and then post it, and then that's it. That's that's the only social media I need to do. So, uh, but it's still here. It's still around. So we'll we'll see. We'll see how we'll we'll see how far it falls, and if it does fall, fuck it, man. We'll uh, we we've got our we've got our WhatsApp chat. We'll uh, meet up in New York sometime. Yeah, man. I mean, I think stuff will change no matter what. This kind of thing just that's how it works. Platforms rise and fall. Like you know, Twitter as kind of like a mini blog aggregator. That if that sounds like a foreign language to you, it's probably because you're on the younger side of the listeners, which also would be a surprise because I think most of our listeners are our age or older. But like in the 2000s, there was blogs and there was Facebook, you know, MySpace, um, LiveJournal, stuff like Zanga, Black Planet, stuff like that. I mean, then Black Planet was a forum, but you had awful of forums, you had FARC, you had lots of like micro forums about shit. You had stuff like bodybuilding.com. Like those are just things that come to mind. And... um Twitter is just everything all together. It's just every single forum, every single blogging site all thrown together. And I don't know, like, yeah, it's got some huge problems and it's always been problematic and there's always been things about it that just sucked. But like on a whole, yeah, it's- Twitter's been a dump. Twitter, Twitter was a dumpster fire before Elon Musk came along. Um, don't, don't get me wrong. It's not great that he's here, but you know, all these shitty accounts like Libs of TikTok existed before uh, Elon Musk. So- it's always it's always been shit, uh, and I don't know. I I like I said, I'm still there. Uh, I'm still. I will post until they until they force me to not post anymore. I guess. Yeah, and I mean, I, I I think that it's been weird considering that because watching what felt like the collapse of the site. I mean, obviously, it's to be determined what's going to eventually happen. Watching that take place while doing an Australia tour for a podcast that wouldn't exist without Twitter, certainly wouldn't be popular without Twitter. Um, you know, all these experiences I had and then going and meeting some friends and actually getting to meet for the first time in person who I'd met through Twitter. It was weird. It, it was, it was, it was, it gave some perspective. I mean, it was weird in a good way, I guess, like the being cognizant, kind of being aware in the moment of like, wow, this, this is such a strange experience. That was all brought together by the fact that like we happened to use this website to communicate. But on the other hand, it's like it may not be around. And I don't think that I'm like, oh, well, no one's ever going to have this experience ever again. Because like, of course they will. But like as it sort of manifested for us, you and me, uh, the cast of Trash Future, uh, you know, Joe. I mean, Joe and Nick knew each other in person before they started the show. But like all that stuff it might wind up taking a much different path in the future because it just, that path won't be available to people anymore. Like, or at least, you know, as regards a thing occurs because people meet each other on Twitter, they start a show, the show grows, it becomes popular because it's promoted on Twitter. Like people share it, people talk about it. You know what I mean? Like that, that might not exist and that sucks. Yeah. There's, yeah, there, there's a uh, like obviously if you're going to be a professional podcast, if you're going to be people who already have an audience, like the It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia podcast is really funny and it's good, but also they have a built in audience already. Um, so it's probably going to be a little bit harder for smaller, you know, small independent podcasts to, to start up. But I don't know. It's, I, I, I like maybe you can get out on TikTok, maybe uh, Instagram. I don't know. Like it seems like everybody is really trying to pivot to video, and and that's not uh, that's not my thing. But I I don't know, man. Like it's I've long ago I stopped trying to predict what the hell social media is doing because I don't know. It's it's always going to change. Like Facebook, even in Facebook's you know American heyday, was changing every six months. They were updating things. They were fucking with the algorithm. They were pivoting to this or that. And, uh, you know, I kind of see Twitter doing the same thing and we see where Facebook is now. Uh, it's really kind of shunned by a lot of the younger generation, at least in America. So I don't know, maybe, maybe Twitter will do the same thing. Maybe somebody will finally slap it out of, uh, Musk's hands and, uh, and take over it and do something with it. I don't know. 
or it's going to collapse in on itself and uh, we'll see you on the other side. But uh, one way or another, it's been fun. Uh, and it's still, it still kind of is fun. Uh, as long as you, I don't know, as, as long as you don't take it seriously, I guess. I mean, it's Twitter. I think I feel insanely grateful to get to do what I do for a living. And I wouldn't be doing this or certainly not in the same capacity had it not been for Twitter and the way Twitter works. I wouldn't have met Riley. I wouldn't have guessed it on Trash Future. I probably wouldn't be doing the same type of podcasting work. And I, I, I've i never been comfortable. Well, okay, I'll take that back. I am not going to be someone who uh, <laughs> gloms on to self-promotion when people you know, refer to things about his work. I have, of course, heard people refer to the Nate Bethay Extended Universe. Now, that always weirds me out, not in a bad way, but just it's just sort of like, because most of that stuff, that's it's not like some deliberate master plan. I'm just a guy who does a certain job. But I don't think that this would have come about in any way, because I wouldn't have met you. I wouldn't have met Riley. I wouldn't have met Joe. Actually, it was a um, friend of the show, Kevin Frent, who uh, DM'd me sometime in 2018 and was like, yo, man, Lions Led by Donkeys is a really good show, but like the sound quality is fucking terrible. Can you help? <laughs> and I just reached out to Joe because he and I, he knew me from this show. And I was like, yo, man, like I'm quitting my job and I'm doing podcast production. Do you need a producer? And that that's how it happened. Riley had me as a guest. And then I followed the account, the Trash Future account, and he used it to post about like, I'm so bad at audio. Can anyone help me? And I was like, yeah, maybe I can. <laughs> will, someone rid me of, <laughs> will someone rid me of this terrible priest? I mean, genuinely, it was literally, he was like, ah, I think I'm going to lose this episode, guys. It's going to be late this week. I'm so bad at audio. Please help. And I was like, Riley, I, I, I think I can help you. I do this for a corporate job. I can give it a try. And, and the first time I did an episode for them, it was like six people in, the, in a room plus Trevor Strunk from um from uh, no cartridge nope no cartridge and yeah. it was it was Trevor's track and then like a USB mixer fucking one one mono mix down track of all six of whomever else people fucking in the room everyone speaking at different volumes complete nightmare it must have taken me like 6 hours to edit that and i gave it to Riley and put it out and then i got a dm from Hussein and he was like what did you do? That's the best sounding episode we've ever had. And I was like, I, I remember telling Cynthia, I was like, "Yeah, babe, I think I might be in with these guys. I think the show is going somewhere. And I was right. I mean, I knew, I knew it had potential, man. I remember listening to one of their episodes when they asked me to be a guest and I wanted to know what I was walking into. And I was laughing my ass off on the New York City subway and people were looking at me like I was a freak. And I was like, this show, sound quality is not great, but it's really funny. I, I genuinely think it might go somewhere. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like when uh, um, our producer quit and you were just like, I think I'm pretty sure I can do this. I don't think we need a producer. I think I think I can do this. And you did. So it's been great. If you ever leave, uh, there goes the podcast, I guess. Or or I guess I'm going to try to to knock things together. I don't we know. can ask Tom. Shout out to. Yeah, Tom. I got Tom now. Tom, Tom and I, while well, you were gone, Tom and I uh, got tight. So uh, you're out. I'm, I'm, I'm outsourcing to cheap Irish labor now. So shouts out to Irish Tom who uh, has helped Francis and Joe um, and Devin with uh, with covering down on some of my production while I've been in Australia. Um, that's and God, dude, I uh, this is easily the most disjointed dad chat we've ever fucking done. So people are either going to love it or they're going to absolutely yeah, hate we're it. gonna. It's fine. You're you're half asleep and like we haven't talked in a while, so but it's fine. Look, we're we're at time anyway. I got to get I got to get to my normal job. Um, I don't. I don't think that when this comes out, we're going to have a bonus episode, but uh, we do put out three bonus episodes uh, a a month. Um, It is, you know, a lot of uh, Zoo Crew stuff with me and Joe Kasabian and uh, Shox. Uh, We also regularly feature stuff with Tom and uh, Carrie Shockey of 33rd County where they talk Irish stuff uh, or Boston stuff, one or the other. The Boston-Irish connection, as, the, as it were. So, uh, you know, we, we, we have a lot of uh, content out there. And again, no plans on going anywhere at this point. Uh, feel free to, 
join up. You also get into our Discord, which we have with Lions Led by Donkeys, which is a good time. Uh, a lot of really great people in there, and sometimes not so great people. And it's funny to watch them get bounced out. So um, don't don't be one of those people. Be uh, be a, a chill person that comes in. But uh, yeah, uh, hell of a way, or uh, sorry, patreon.com slash hell of a way to die. We have the store as well. Christmas is coming up. Uh, we have a, a Christmas sale, 15% off everything. If you put in uh, Xmas as your, um, a- as your, your, your code to get you know, stuff off. So that's all there. New stuff in the store, blah, blah, blah. Uh, self-promotion, self-promotion. Um, Nate. Glad to have you back. Looking forward to doing more uh, episodes with you. Hopefully by next week, you're back on a normal schedule. I really hope so. But all I can say, Francis, is the fans might have heard it, but I certainly heard you slip up there and almost say we put out three episodes a week. And oh, and wait, I thought ooh, to myself, yeah, no. oh God, no, please Things no. Have changed. Tom's Tom's really Tom's really whipped your ass into shape. No, Tom. Th- God bless Tom. He's uh, I, I I did a uh, interview with uh, Matt. Matt Farwell and uh, we had to use Zoom and my audio is fucked up and I didn't record a local because I'm a professional podcaster. So Tom, Tom has slapped that together and hopefully made me not sound like a complete asshole. So uh, we, we, Tom, Tom and I, like I said, we're, we're good. We're tight. We know, we know what we're doing, but I'm glad to have you back because you write better um, uh, intros and, uh, and show notes titles for yeah. the, the podcast. So yeah, you're, you're funnier than I am on that. When I get it, it's just like, uh, here's what happened. I don't know. Fucking listen to it, I guess. See, that's, that's why that's, that's, that's the specialty there. You know, that's, uh, I, I, all, all those years of having to fucking write, you know, have pithy fucking lines to hand things over during the safety brief. Uh, you know what I mean? This is officer and NCO excellence, but Listen, thank you for being a listener. Thank you for your patience with me on this episode. Uh, it's it's 3 p.m. British time, and I think I'm going to fall asleep in about 10 minutes. Um, greatly appreciate you being listeners, and we will talk to you soon. Talk to you later, guys. Zoom, zoom, zoom.